A dozen short years ago, I was this guy, living what you could call a perfect life. I ran nearly every day. Kayaked and hiked. My friends and I skied like irresponsible teenagers. I had a strong marriage and two great kids. I loved my work. As an architect, I designed environments to support and benefit the needs of individuals who struggled with physical or emotional challenges, and believed I was incredibly sensitive to their needs. I knew that the environments we create can help or hinder and I spent days and nights meeting with patients, families, and caregivers, listening to heartbreaking stories of how a car crash, or a flash of lightning, changed lives in the blink of an eye. I laid in hospital beds at night, trying to imagine I was an uneasy patient, listening to the squeaky wheels of carts in the hallway, bells and dings of page calls and muffled conversations outside my door. Before designing a psychiatric hospital, I spent time locked in a padded seclusion room with nothing to focus on except the harsh fluorescent light overhead. When asked to design a substance abuse rehabilitation facility, I spent a night at the bedside of someone enduring severe opioid withdrawals. I tried my best to gain true understanding and empathy, but with each of those exercises, I knew I would drive home in the morning and my perfect life would be exactly how I left it. Until one day, it wasn't. To avoid a surprise party on my 50th birthday, I snuck off for a week-long solo hike in the mountains. My goal was to reflect on my first 50 years and reset my mind to tackle more epic adventures and challenges for the decades ahead. Alone on a trail, deep in the woods, I took an uncharacteristically clumsy fall. That was the first sign of things to come. A short while later I found myself in the waiting room of Mass General's ALS clinic, surrounded by people who struggled to walk or talk. I was terrified. Please. No. This couldn't be my future. Then, after months of tests, I was diagnosed with a rare degenerative neuromuscular disease called primary lateral sclerosis. It's a variant of ALS that screws up the signals the brain is sending to the muscles. Slowly my abilities would deteriorate, just like the others in that waiting room. This couldn't be my future. I had kids to put through college and so many things I planned to accomplish. The changes in my ability weren't instantaneous like when people suffer a stroke or a car crash. My evolution happened in slow motion. I kept running for a year and a half after the onset, even completed one last marathon, but several falls and a broken nose finally ended that. My legs, nor my mouth, just wouldn't obey my brain. A few months later I was using a walker to take even a few steps. Then one day, I couldn't get through the automatic door at my office in the 10 seconds it stayed open. I had to swallow my pride and get a wheelchair. Just like that, I joined the world's largest minority group. The 26% of us who are living with disabilities. Of course, disabilities come in many forms, mine is just really easy to spot. Of that 26%, the largest group is mobility impairments, defined as having the inability to walk any distance or climb steps. Look around this beautiful music hall, how many obstacles do you see? They've done a nice job but trust me, they're still there. It took three strong people to carry me up onto the stage. Physical barriers are everywhere. Most of us, the lucky ones, are blind to them. I know I used to be, and it was my literal job to see them. It's been 31 years since the Americans with Disabilities Act became law, but as I was about to learn firsthand, even after all these years, it's wrong to assume anything is compliant or accessible. As a self-conscious guy, it's hard enough to be just living with a disability, but the stress and anxiety of the unknown can feel overwhelming. Intimidated by both the obvious barriers, obstacles, and unseen impediments, the easiest thing is to disconnect. I had always been outgoing, but now, like too many people, I felt intense isolation. I was shut out of parties and gatherings at the homes of family and friends, where doorways were up a flight of steps, where there were no bathrooms I could wedge my wheelchair into. And the downtown Portsmouth that I knew so well, was suddenly a labyrinth of steps, broken sidewalks, narrow passageways, and inaccessible restrooms. All that empathy and understanding I had strived for, 
didn't prepare me for what people with disabilities face every minute of their lives. Now, living it myself, I finally understood. I always hoped to understand what challenges they faced, and what their lives must be like. Be careful what you wish for. If I was going to reconnect with my community, I needed some way to take the mystery out of all the barriers and landmines I seemed to encounter at every turn. The Chamber of Commerce website had an accessibility link, I thought bingo. I had what I needed. But I quickly discovered the information was self-reported by the venue's able-bodied owners. They seemed blind that there were steps leading to their doorways or that their restrooms were on a floor below or above and they had no elevators. The only thing worse than no information, is bad information. Trust me, waiting until nature calls is a horrible time to find out the restroom is off limits. <laughs> now, consider the barriers that aren't physical but attitudinal. Ableism is simply defined as discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. And some businesses put in more effort to find exemptions or excuses than they do to find solutions. They make no attempt at all to meet these needs, no way in, no accommodating with furniture arrangements, or not even mounting a few grab bars. This lack of consideration for those with disabilities is like hanging a sign on the door that says, disabled not welcome. It's hard to imagine our society allowing that type of discrimination towards other minority groups. But during my ventures downtown, I happened upon a few spots that had reasonable accessibility. This gave me an idea. I asked my coworker and Weidman, to help me build a guide to map accessibility-friendly places to eat, drink and socialize in downtown Portsmouth. With her energy, we quickly inspected 80 or so restaurants, coffee shops, bars, and arts and entertainment venues downtown. A second coworker, William Tucker, jumped on board to help with our website and he gave us the name, Access Navigators. That's what we needed to steer around the obstacles, a navigator. We identify a few basic things people with disabilities may want to know. Is there parking nearby? Is the entrance accessible? How about the restrooms? Does the interior layout provide clear paths? Do the furnishings accommodate accessibility? We got noticed by the nursing and occupational therapy departments at UNH and became an accredited student project each semester. Today we train teams of students and then they branch out to review communities across the state and beyond. Besides simply mapping where accessibility currently exists, our goal is to raise awareness wherever it's lacking. We gladly do that for anyone who asks, from the smallest mom and pop shop to large facilities. We've even been asked to present our little hometown idea to a national senior living conference in Washington DC, and a global aging symposium that was held in Toronto. Meeting the requirements set out by the ADA and the building codes are just the minimum that should be expected, it's formulaic, and uncreative. But I'm a huge advocate of universal design. Simply put, universal design means designing for all abilities equally. It's an attitude of respect that blends sensitivity, creativity, and compassion. When my firm was hired to renovate the housing at Crotched Mountain Rehabilitation Center for medically dependent kids and adults, we were asked to connect the basement of the kids' dorm to the basement of their adjacent school. But after spending time with those kids, their families and the caregivers, the thought of subjecting them to a windowless basement tunnel that passed by boiler rooms would be adding another soul-sucking chore to their days. Instead, we proposed a 500-foot-long glass connector that would let them take in the vistas, appreciate the changing weather, and actually enjoy the twice-daily commute. Sure, a windowless basement hallway would have been accessible design, it would get them from point A to point B, but would the kids and caregivers gather there to search for rainbows? Enjoy the first snowfall? And watch lightning storms? The answer is obvious. And the insight is that thoughtful inclusive design can uplift disabled individuals, and their caretakers, and all of us for that matter, in life-affirming ways. How many of you noticed the superb example of universal design before you entered the music hall today? Outside the music hall, you previously may not have noticed the old narrow sloping raised brick sidewalks, but they used to scare the hell out of me. 
Dropping one of the wheelchair's wheels off a curb is a surefire trip to the emergency room. And if you didn't appreciate it on your way in, stop on your way out and absorb what the new design means to someone with a mobility or vision impairment. And if you are not part of that 26%, just wait a few years. After all, we may be fortunate enough to escape life-altering illness and injury, but if we're lucky, we'll grow old. Then we will be adding to the unprecedented shift in the world's population. In the next 25 years, those of us over the age of 60 will double, and people living past 80 will triple. With that, the number of us living with disabilities will soar. The raw truth is that many of you will experience a range of disabilities in your lifetime. And I can tell you from experience, only your abilities will be altered, not your needs and desires to feel welcomed, to feel included, to be engaged with your communities and the people who are meaningful to you. So, for all of us, I'm asking each one of you as a member of society to notice barriers, strive for inclusion and help adapt our environments to welcome people of all abilities, enabling access to lives of engagement, community, and fulfillment. Never in a million years did I picture myself sitting in a wheelchair in front of you and having to share my thoughts using a robotic voice. But we never know what our individual tomorrows will look like. What lessons will be thrown at us? I discovered that any one of us, including me, and perhaps including you, or the person sitting next to you, can, at any time, join the world's largest, and too often excluded and isolated minority group. When your life takes this limiting turn, it's easy to ask, why me? Maybe, being on this stage, talking to you, helped define my answer to that question. Thank you for listening.